Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today we're officially releasing HashDV. What the heck is HashDV? Well, let me show you. Have you ever wanted your Black Matter IDV to magically look like this after the click of a button? What about a Cobalt Strike Loader? You load the shellcode in IDA and you magically have it do this? How about Drydex? You ever try and reverse Drydex? All kinds of hashes everywhere, you gotta resolve them. What if you had one click of a button to do this? That's what we're releasing with HashDB. So what HashDB is, is a service that basically has a backend that is uh, supplied by a GitHub repository, it's open source. Any analyst can add a malware hashing algorithm to it and it'll be automatically pushed up to the cloud and the algorithm will be run against a huge word list that we maintain and a hash table will be generated. Then the hash table will be available here through hashdb.openanalysis.net. Now this is an API and you can write your own scripts to uh, talk to the API in any way you want. Uh, use it in any tools you want. It's open source, free always. And the reason why we set it up as an API is just so that it's an easy way to interface with this. Now, if you don't wanna use an API, we also have a IDA client here on GitHub, which is also open source. So you can just download this release, the hashdb.py, drop it into your IDA plugins directory, and go to Tim, start working with it. Now that's what HashDB is in a nutshell. And if you just want to start resolving API hashes in your malware, that's all you need to know. But let's back up and let's talk a little bit about what API hashing is in malware, why it's such a pain in the rear for analysts, and why we think this is the best solution going forward. So in order to do that, let's just talk about API hashing to begin with. So I have a little diagram here that I can pull up, and this will just provide a quick overview of what an API hash is if you've never encountered one before uh, in malware. Now we've done a few videos talking about resolving API hashes in the past, so hopefully you're kind of familiar with the concept, but I'll just break it down for you so it's easy to visualize here. So here we have the source code for the malware, and the malware developer has, you know, wants to call a Windows API. So for example, the Sleep API, which is an, an export of the kernel 32 DLL, right? So we have kernel 32 uh, export sleep, and then that sleep can be called in the malware source here. Now what the malware developer does is they create a custom compiler, or in some cases, this will be a macro that they'll insert into their code, um, which has resolved at comp compile time. Sometimes this is like an extra compile step that happens. Uh, it depends on how they set it up. That's not too important. What's important is this compiler, this custom uh, macro or script that the developer uses will locate these Windows API calls and will create a hash of the module, the DLL, and the function uh, that's being called, and it'll convert those into a hash using some sort of hashing algorithm. Now, malware authors are always trying to stay ahead of malware analysts, so they're always changing their algorithms, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute when we talk about why HashDB is so powerful. But Basically, they choose an algorithm, and anywhere where they've called a Windows API, that algorithm at compile time will turn this API into a hash of a module and a function. And it will replace this code with some extra code. So instead of this one call to the Windows API, you'll see something that kind of looks like this. So what will happen is they will insert a resolve hash algorithm into their code, and they will call it passing the arguments of the module hash and the function hash. And then the result from that call will be a pointer to the virtual address of that Windows API function. There's a bunch of magic that happens in the resolve hash function. And then they will call that pointer, right? So this code here is effectively the same as just calling into the Windows API sleep directly, only they're now doing this extra step here. And you'll notice in this code, the string sleep and the string kernel 32 do not exist. All we have is a hash. And so what this means is when you're analyzing this code, you need to figure out how the resolve hash function works in order to reverse engineer these hashes and figure out what API calls are being used. So this is actually 
a cheap method for the developer to obfuscate their calls. And depending on how they build the resolve hash function, it could be very time consuming for the analyst to go back and figure out how all this works in order to figure out what these API calls are. Now, we won't get into this in too much detail. Um, there's two different methods. You can do it statically or dynamically. To do it statically, you basically reverse engineer this hash function, then you build a hash table, and then you figure out basically by matching these hashes to the original input of the hash table, the string that's being input in the hash table, you figure out what those hashes represent, right? Which strings they represent. Now, to do it dynamically, which some analysts prefer, you would run this in a debugger, you would put a breakpoint on this uh, piece of code here, and then you would look at the address where this is pointing to figure out which virtual address for the Windows API that's pointing at. So in a nutshell, that's API hashing. So how does HashDB help with this? Well, if we go back to HashDB here and we look at the uh, hash backend, so this is our GitHub repository here, um, you can see that we have a whole bunch of common algorithms that have been observed in malware being used for hashing. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. Obviously, there are new algorithms and malware developers can create new algorithms. And when they do, you're going to have to reverse engineer that algorithm. But the power that HashDB brings is the fact that this is a community sourced repository where anyone can add an algorithm and adding an algorithm to HashDB is really simple. All you have to do is copy this boilerplate code, add your hashing code in here, whatever you've re reversed engineered, and then run a few tests on it to make sure that it's uh, executable and to make sure that it passes our hash verification tests. And then it'll actually automatically be pushed up to the cloud and run against our word list and then be available through the API. So this means that within a few minutes, we say no more than five minutes, but within a few minutes, if you know the algorithm, you can have a full hash table available to start reverse engineering with. So this is about as streamlined a process as you can get for new algorithms. And the cool thing about this is it being community sourced is as soon as the first analyst reverse engineers a sample, that algorithm should be available to everyone. So it kind of spreads the burden of keeping up on these hashing algorithms across all the analysts who want to participate in this. It's a nice way of giving back to the community, and it's a good way of keeping on top of these things and putting pressure on malware developers to update their code, um, which again, cost them money, right? We want to put a little pressure on them, and this puts some pressure on them. The reason why it puts pressure on them is because as soon as the algorithm has been added here, it's a simple click to remove an entire layer of obfuscation from binary. And I'm gonna show you that in just a second. But before I do, I wanna give a shout out to shellcode hashes from the Flare team. This was uh, developed, I don't know when it was, it says seven years ago here. Uh, it feels longer than that to me. But this was this came out a long, long time ago. And this is kind of what we based our idea on. So uh, shellcode hashes is just a simple uh, Python script that does, it has a whole bunch of different algorithms in it that, and they're being added. It's kind of the same idea, it's community sourced. And then they have a local database that you can add DLLs to and generate your own word list. So very similar concept. The only difference is this is not a cloud-based solution. So it isn't able to crowdsource the word list, which is the last part of HashDB that makes it so powerful. So there's a finite number of DLLs in Windows. So it's always going to be easy to basically create a hash table for yourself, for your own use of all the DLLs, all the exports using all these algorithms, right? It's fine for individual use. But what we've noticed in the past, say, four years, uh, specifically with ransomware developers, but this is kind of spreading out throughout the entire malware development community, is the malware developers aren't just using hashes for APIs. They're using hashes for other strings in order to obfuscate other sections of the code. And the place where we see this the most, the most frustrating area for me, and the reason why I first started working on HashDB is with the process kill list. So a lot of ransomware will have a list of processes that they want to kill before they deploy their ransomware because those processes might interfere with the deployment of the ransomware. Now, these are almost always hash lists. They're not strings. And figuring out what those processes 
R means that you have to maintain a giant word list of all known processes that are run on Windows and generate a giant hash table for all those processes. So at that point, maintaining your own word list becomes kind of difficult because each analyst is going to have different exposures to different environments, and that means they're going to have different lists of processes. And it's kind of hard because if you're missing a hash from the hash list, then you're not going to be able to resolve it. And then you're just going to have to start blindly adding every process name you know to your list in the hopes of finding it. I've been there. That's basically what started this whole thing rolling. So what HashDB does is it crowdsources that word list. So any analyst can go to HashDB and go to the API and add in their own string. You can post the string here and we'll accept it. We'll add it to our list if we don't already have it. And we'll do some transforms on it, like uppercasing it and lowercasing it to make sure we have all variations of it. Because of this, we have millions of words already in HashDB. The HashDB database is enormous, and I've yet to find a hash that's not in there in these process lists, APIs, and registry keys. Registry keys is another place where you see malware authors using malware hashes to resolve the strings. In some cases, some malware is obfuscated to the point where there are almost no strings in it, no strings in the config, no strings in the binary, no encrypted strings. They're only using hashes to resolve things. And this is very frustrating if you have to maintain your own word list because if you're missing just a single string, you can't move on with your reverse engineering till you found it because you don't know what that function is doing. So this is our attempt to solve it. I don't know if it's gonna work, but so far with limited testing, myself and a few other reverse engineers, it seems like we're on the right track here. So my pitch to you is add algorithms to our Git repository. Any new algorithm you find, even if the code isn't great, we'll fix it up for you. Just put it in there and issue a pull request and we'll work with you to get it up to speed and into the database. The other request is add strings. If there's a string that we're missing here, just do a post request here. It's super simple. You grab the URL here, create a JSON post request. A single curl request is all you need and you can put that string in there for anyone else to use. Um, so that's our ask for you. Now with that, let me show you the power of this thing. We'll hop over to Ida and I'll show you what it looks like when it's in action. Okay, so we're in Ida here and we have our HashDB plugin loaded. You can see this nice ASCII art here, <laughs> the fact that it's loaded. And what this gives you, if you right click in the disassembly window, is it'll give you some HashDB related options here. So what I have loaded is a very simple loader that's used to load a Cobalt Strike beacon. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the hash hunt function to automatically identify what the hashing algorithm is. And then I'm gonna show you how to automatically resolve some API calls. So let's pop into this function here. Let's see our disassembly view. So we'll F5 and we'll take a look at these calls here. So we can see this is what our function looks like with no API hash resolving. And of course, we could always try and reverse engineer this, but this is kind of like an obfuscated shell code type loader. Um, there isn't, you know, there isn't a whole lot here, but they're passing in the function that's being used to resolve this. It's, it's kind of a mess. Instead of trying to reverse engineer it, let's just use our easy button here. We'll just right click on the hash and we'll do hash db hunt algorithm. So right now, HashDB is taking that algorithm and it's checking it against all of the different hash tables that we have. And we found that it matches the Metasploit algorithm. Now this isn't guaranteed that this is the Metasploit hashing algorithm. It just means that it matched that table. If it matches multiple tables, it's gonna be up to the analyst to pick which one uh, they think that is the best for it. Of course, you could always just try different ones. Um, you know, if you don't wanna do any reverse engineering, you just wanna click around, you can do that as well. So here, let's choose Metasploit and then we'll right click again and we'll do a HashDB lookup. So we found that this actually resolves to HTTP open request and it's part of the WinNet um, module. And so what HashDB allows you to do is to import every single export from that module as a hash. Now we're not gonna do that here today. We don't need to, cause we just, there's only a couple hashes we need to resolve, but I'll show you in the next example where this kind of helps out. So we'll say no. And now you'll see this hasn't done anything to the hash, but what it has done is it's added an enum that matches this hash with a string. So if you guys aren't familiar with enums, it's just a structure that matches a number with a string. Maybe easier just to show you. View, subview, local types. And we can see the hashdb strings enum. 
And if you right click edit this, I'll show you, you'll probably see this is familiar. So basically this is what HashDB has automat automatically added. Uh, the name of it is HashDB strings. That's just the default. And of course you can change that if you want. Um, in fact, let me just cancel this out here and I'll show you under edit. Oops, we have to go back to our disassembly view or our pseudocode or whichever view. Edit, plugins, HashDB. And this is where all your settings for HashDB are. So you can always change these settings at any time. You can change the API URL if you just run, want to run your own internal HashDB. You can change the enum name here. So if you want to use different enums or different uh, parts of the malware or different modules, you can always change these. Um, you can enable XORing, which I'll show you uh, in the next sample. And of course, you can select your algorithm here. And if you want to, right now we're only showing the algorithm that you're using, but you could refresh algorithms, which will pull every algorithm from the HashDB database. And then you'll have to select here. We'll just look for Metasploit. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so that's how you change your settings. Now, how do you tell Ida that this hash is an enum? Well, you press the M key or you right click on it and choose enum. And you have to choose the enum name here. And then there we go, it's resolved for you. So let's do a few more here. Uh, we'll resolve this one and then we'll press M. There we go. And we'll resolve this one. There we go, okay. So we can already see with a little bit of button clicking that this is gonna be some HTTP requests. They're doing open request, send request, right? This is, looks like this is the C2 part of the uh, Cobalt Strike Beacon downloader. So this looks like we found the download function. So that's a quick demo of how you can use this to sort of click and resolve hashes uh, individually. Next, let's look at Drydex. I'll show you how to resolve hashes in bulk. Okay, so we have a recent Drydex 32-bit sample loaded up here. This is actually a fork of Drydex called Doppel Drydex, but it doesn't really matter. It's still the Drydex source code, basically. Um, and they use API hashing as well, but it's a little bit more involved, and I'm gonna show you how that works here. So again, let's pop into our pseudocode view here. We'll do an F5, and I'm gonna show you how to find API hashes quickly. So we'll just grab the first function here, uh, we'll just keep going in until we see some hashes being passed to a function. I don't see any hashes being passed. Uh, no hashes being passed. No. Oh, there we go. That looks like some hashes being passed here, right? So this is how you find API hashing being resolved in a binary that you're reverse engineering. Just flip through a bunch of the functions until you find a function where two hashes, basically two D words are being sent to it, and then take a look. If you have a binary that has no API calls in it, right? There's, we don't see any API calls here, right? It's all just hashes. <laughs> so if you see something like this, locate the function where the, those hashes are being passed to it and the result from that function is being used in the code, right? Do that and you should be good to go. So let's uh, look at this actual function here. So we'll name it as malware resolve hash. And we'll take a look at it here. It looks like it's a wrapper for something else. Now I'm gonna show you something here. They have an XOR in this. Now I did that very quickly. I wouldn't expect you to uh, reverse engineer. That's not even reverse engineering. I basically know where this is, but that's because I've looked at Drydex for like five years. <laughs> so <laughs> I've seen this a million times, but basically what they do to add a little extra obfuscation is they have their hashing algorithm and then they XOR each hash with a stat constant in the malware. So what we can do with HashDB is we can right click on this, say set XOR key, or again, if we wanted to from our settings, we could go up to plugins, HashDB, and set the XOR key here. And once we've done that, then we can start looking up those hashes and see if we can identify the algorithm. So let's go back here and we'll see if we can identify this algorithm. So it's looking, ah, oh, it's CRC32, right? So again, I already knew that because I've looked at Drydex a lot, but Drydex is a basic CRC32 algorithm uh, and a static XOR key in the binary. So let's choose that and we'll right click, hash to be a lookup. Um, it found its kernel 32 DLL. So we could do our trick here, kernel 32 DLL, right? So that resolved that hash. What's this one here? Um, we're gonna actually see there's a little uh, shortcoming in HashDB where if the number is negative, we can't look it up correctly. There's an open bug for it in GitHub. Anyone who's a developer who likes the ID API, probably nobody <laughs> likes that API. Anyone who's good at that API 
um, go there and uh, check it out, see if you can actually give us a little bit of help here. So we'll convert that into a positive value here, then we'll do our hash db lookup. All right, uh, let's see, it looks like kernel 32. See, there's a bunch of different modules that match that, and that just means that each one of those modules has an export that matches that value. Of course, many different modules can have the same function name in them. If you think about uh, modules that have things like uh, start server or you know functions like that that are common between multiple modules. So what we do in HashDB is when we find a collision like that, we leave it up to the analyst to decide which one of these modules makes the most sense. I don't think that the core debugging <laughs> module is, uh, is likely here. I think it's more likely it's kernel 32. Of course, with kernel 32, because kernel base is a wrapper around kernel 32, or it's a, that's the, that's the wrong way to say it. I know you Windows internals guys, but basically because they share um, the same exports, you're gonna see both of them popping up a lot, but let's just choose kernel 32, and we will actually, in this case, import all the exports from it. Now this takes a little while because kernel 32, I think has like 2000 exports or something like that. It's, it's crazy, it's a huge DLL. So it's gonna take a while to add those, but now if we press M, turn that into a uh, enum and we've resolved that. Now I'm gonna show you a tip here. When you have a single resolving function like this, which is taking the module and the function hash, what you can do is you just change the type of those arguments and then you can reuse that enum to be the enum that you've created, the hash to be strings. And then anywhere where that function shows up, um, those arguments will be accurately converted. So let me show you how to do that now. We'll just change the type, set item type, and we'll change these arguments to be hash db underscore string. And this one is hash db underscore strings. Now you can see that actually resolves all of the strings anywhere where we have this function and we actually have the enum for those uh, for those hashes, it will resolve them. If we don't have the enum, that just tells us we need to actually look these ones up and add it to our enum. So let's just change it from negative to positive and we'll do a lookup for this. And then we'll do a lookup for this one. Import that DLL. Give it a minute while it adds all those to the enum. And then of course, we're gonna have to F5 to refresh the view here. And there we go. So that is how to bulk resolve API hashes. And doesn't that look a lot easier? We've done no reverse engineering. We've relied entirely on HashDB to do this. Now I'm gonna show you one more example, a different type of API resolving in a different method that is also covered by HashDB, but the way we get there is very different than here. So let me open up Dark Matter Ransomware and I'll show you how their API hashing works. Did I say Dark Matter? Black Matter. Dark side ransomware became black matter ransomware, and I always say dark matter. I don't know, it's crazy. Anyway, <laughs> so here we go. We've opened up black matter ransomware, and I'm gonna show you how they do their API resolving. It's very different. So here they have a function, um, and let's actually, in this case, we'll show both the uh, decompiled view here, split screen with the disassemble view, and let me turn this into a text view so we can actually see it and I will move this over a little bit here and we'll right click synchronize, there we go. So what we have here is we have a, looks like a function that's being called repeatedly and we have two pieces of data being passed to it. So we have this, which is a placeholder in memory with no data in it. And then we have a D word, which is a place in memory that has what looks like a whole bunch of hashes in it. And if we go into that function here, um, we can see that there is an XOR, just like in uh, Drydex. And there's a little bit more going on here. They actually create a little piece of shell code where there's an XOR and a jump to the actual virtual address that's being resolved by their hash function. But I don't wanna get into that here because I wanna focus on HashDB. I will go into this in another video where we talk more about anti-debug features in Black Matter that'll be posted on our Patreon later on. So for those of you who are subbed to our Patreon, I'll explain a little bit more about how this works. But just for HashDB, we don't really need to know. All we need to know is that there's an XOR in their algorithm. So the first thing we wanna do is just set our XOR key here. And then we'll pop back to our function overview here and we'll take a look at these um, addresses here. Why don't we see if we can scan, why don't we see if we can find out what the algorithm is first? So 
let it do its thing. It's found two algorithms, uh, ROAR13, remember ROAR13 from Metasploit, and add ROAR13. So there's two different ways you can do this. You can either ROAR13 then add, or you can add then ROAR13. So I'll just choose this one. They both match, um, and we'll just go from there. I have done this before. Add ROAR13, it's funny that hash table is very similar to this one. In some instances, it's not correct, and uh, this is actually the correct one. But because it costs you nothing to choose the algorithms, even if you choose the wrong one, you can always go back and choose the other one. It's just a couple clicks, so it's not a big deal. And of course, if you want to delete the enum, if you created an enum that's incorrect, you could just go into enums and delete the enum that you created. It's not a big deal. So let's choose this here, and then we will do a hash lookup. And it found a hash, which is good. Uh, it says, do you want to import all these functions from this module? No, we don't, because we have a different sort of scenario here. So you'll notice that they're actually resolving all of these hashes here together. And then we see another section here, the next section, they're resolving all of these hashes, and again, and again, and again. Now, this is closer to what would be considered an import address table. So this is sort of like an old school way of doing a dynamic import address table. If you've heard those terms before, that's what they're doing here. So this is a different style of resolving hashed APIs or hashed imports. Um, what they do here is they basically use, you saw that, so this was the first function in the malware here, right? It's the first thing that's called. So what they do is they resolve their import address table first then all of those APIs are resolved for the rest of the code. So this is different from what Drydex and that Metasploit-based shellcode loader uh, do, which we looked at. Um, those ones are called inline resolving, where you call the function with the hash and it resolves it inline. This is considered an import address table resolve or dynamic import address table, where you resolve the table in memory and then you reference the table. So that's a little bit different. We can't do our trick where we do a bulk import and we can't do our trick where we set the type of a function to be the enum. What we wanna do instead is we wanna take advantage of the hashdb import address table scanner. So what we can do here is we can select all of these addresses, right click, and do the hashdb scan IAT. And what that'll do is that'll actually parse this out into individual D words. It'll look up each individual D word, as you can see here, and it will resolve each one. If it can't resolve one of them, it'll just turn it into a D word and leave a label for it. So it's easy for you to see which ones aren't resolved. Now in this case, of course, we have all of the functions. The only things that it didn't resolve are the CCCC, which uh, if you watch our other video, you'll see that's actually just a marker for the end of the table. And it didn't resolve the first hash because that's actually not a function export, that's a hash of the DLL module name. So that's a little bit different and they use a different algorithm for that, so that's why it didn't resolve. In cases where you have two different algorithms being used, you're gonna have to switch the hash DB algorithm and resolve them individually. But in our case, we don't really care because that's just the module name and it's not really used anywhere, it's just used to actually resolve these. So we have these resolved here. And of course, you could do this for all these different tables here. You just highlight them, right click and scan IAT and it'll resolve them. You can use this same scan IAT if you have a list of hashes for registry keys or a list of hashes for process names. It's just a way to scan through a list of D words in memory and resolve each one. And we've created labels or names with a pointer to each enum so we can do something uh, that I'll show you in a second here. I'll, so I'll grab a smaller table so it's a little bit easier. Um, we'll right click, scan IAT, and then I'll show you why we add those labels. So we can grab this and we can turn it into a struct. So right click, create struct from selection. We'll name it struct IAT zero. Go back here. So this has been turned into a struct. And if we look, we'll have to label that, label that actually. So this will be a uh, struct IAT zero pointer to it. Let's look at our code here to where that's actually referenced. We'll just F5 to make sure that label appear, appears. So um, the way this works is those um, hashes, obviously those are hashes that are being used to look up 
the virtual address of the function. The virtual address is actually stored in this piece of memory here that's copied over. So we don't want to have to relabel this stuff. In fact, it'd be very difficult to try and match up the labels in the hashes to these memory offsets. Instead, what we want to do is we want to just grab this and change this to be a structure itself. So we'll press Y here, struct IIT zero. All right. So now let's turn that into a struct. And then anywhere where that's referenced in the code, we will then have those imports being resolved for us. Reference to it here. Uh, there we go. So we can see that structure now has a pointer to MD4 update, which is our function name uh, in the code. So this is just another way of resolving API hashes. This time it's done in a table form. So you can use this trick that we've showed you here to basically bulk resolve those hashes, create a structure, and then apply that structure to the memory section where the virtual addresses for those functions are being stored. So again, very quick, we haven't really done any reverse engineering. We've been relying on HashDB, and we have APIs now in our black matter sample. So that's it for the release of HashDB. Go ahead and use it, add your algorithms. Um, if you find bugs, log bugs on GitHub, I'll also give a shout out to our Discord here. So if you want help, if you run into issues, you can join our Discord here. And also on Discord is a group of people who are working on a Ghydra. Hey, Hydra plugin. So right now we just have an IDA plugin for HashDB, but if you want to help build a Ghydra plugin, join the Discord, uh, join the group, and hopefully we can get one of those out pretty soon to you guys, because I know a lot of you are using Ghydra. So there we have it. I hope this is helpful for you guys. Again, we've just been doing some limited testing with it. It seems promising, but we'll see after you guys start using it and let us know uh, what's missing. Add your words if they're missing. Again, if you add words, it just helps the community. So take the five seconds to add them if they're missing and join our Discord, uh, come say hi. Uh, you can ask for features, whatnot, uh, we're always there. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how the uh, anti-debugging works in Black Matter, sub on Patreon and we'll drop a video on that pretty soon. With that, you'll probably see us on a live stream coming soon. We're doing a few more live streams in the near future, so look out for those. And until next time, keep exposing the mechanics behind the malware. Stay curious. You fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me. Yeah, you know you fucking feel me, right?